what we're doing and what we're bringing to them is the opportunity to, uh, metaphorically speaking, go under the hood to see all mm -hmm. of the, um, the working parts and all the mechanics that goes behind the, the our printed Bibles, the, the manuscripts, and all of the technical aspects that go along with those manuscripts. Shalom, I'm here today with Nelson Calvillo, who is a research assistant at the Institute for Hebrew Bible Manuscript Research. And he uh, joined me at the World Congress of Jewish Studies in Jerusalem, where on August 8th, 2022, I gave a lecture to some of the top scholars in the world. Now, just to give you an idea, we, we've done a program before, which we called SBL Reactions or Society of Biblical Literature Reactions, which is an annual conference every year, every year here in the United States uh, on biblical studies. And that is kind of like, in American terms, that would be called like the, um, the World Series of Biblical Studies or uh, the Super Bowl of Biblical Studies. The World Congress of Jewish Studies is like the Olympics. It's like every four or five years or something like that. And it really is, a, in a some sense, a much higher level of, um, of lectures because it's not every year. And I had the opportunity there for the first time to, to speak about the topic, a newly identified 10th to 11th century Oriental Torah scroll in the National Library of Russia in St. Petersburg. And boy, I could, I could unpack all of these uh, phrases there. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to play the video of my lecture, and then Nelson and I are going to discuss it, because we decided that, well, let's be honest, it's, it's a really technical and complicated topic. Uh, Nelson, I actually had somebody walk up to me at the end of my lecture, and he said, and this was like a very intelligent, knowledgeable scholar, he said, Nehemia, you have this incredible skill to take something really boring and make it interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, most people here at this Congress uh, are taking something really interesting and making it boring. And I said, I think this is actually interesting. A and it is interesting, but I had very little time. Technically, I had 20 minutes and I went on for 25. So I overstepped my time for about five minutes. And so I um, had to just rattle off the information as quickly as possible. What I didn't have time for was to explain what for an academic scholar would be considered basic concepts. I just assumed they knew what I was talking about. But for the audience, I want us to take the time and discuss those things. So, um, before we get started, I just do, I do want to explain this term oriental. Uh, it's somewhat of a misnomer. In the United States, oriental would imply East Asia. That's not at all what it means in, in uh, biblical studies, at least. Um, in Jewish studies, oriental is a, is a stand-in for the Hebrew word Mizrahi which is Eastern. And even that's not really an accurate term because what Mizrahi really means are uh, Jews who lived in Muslim countries. So here you have this ironic thing where a Jew who lives in Morocco would be considered Mizrahi, Oriental, whereas a Jew who lived in, where my ancestors came from, Lithuania, which is far to the east of Morocco, would be, be, would be called uh, or, uh, Occidental or Western. Right. Well, what's Western about it? Right. Uh, um, it's actually far to the east. So it's very it's a very strange term. And I think it's a term that has more to do with, um, frankly, Britain and and maybe Germany that coined these terms. But that's the term Orient. So here's what Oriental really means. It doesn't even mean Moroccan. In, the, in this context, Oriental is a category that was established by the um, Hebrew Paleography Project. They went around the world and they identified Hebrew manuscripts with um, dates in them, and they broke up the Jewish world of manuscripts to five regions. They call them five geocultural regions. And one of those regions is Oriental, and Oriental refers to Egypt, Syria, um, Iraq, uh, and Yemen. And then Yemen becomes its own category really later on, but 10th, 11th century Oriental would still include Yemen. In this case, Oriental almost certainly means Egypt, or it could have been written in Israel, but it was found in the Cairo Geniza, which, um, which is in Egypt. And then it made its way to St. Petersburg, Russia, where I saw this uh, Torah scroll in the year 2019. Uh, anything to add there, Nelson? Any thoughts, comments, questions? Really, uh, Dr. Gordon, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for inviting me on again. Um, it was a pleasure. It's, ple it's a pleasure to be here. But it was just as much a pleasure 
to be there in Israel with you as you were presenting uh, for the first time at the World Congress of Jewish Studies. And really my, my initial comment is, um, I think this is gonna be the beauty of, of why the audience will need, need your expertise and your commentary during your presentation, because here we are at the very beginning, and already what you just gave, what you just expounded upon, is, is essential um, for scholars to know. And I would say the audience has you know, the luxury of being able to have, have their Bible, being able to read it, but what we're doing and what we're bringing to them is the opportunity to, uh, metaphorically speaking, go under the hood to see all mm -hmm. of the, the working parts and all the mechanics that goes behind the, the, our printed Bibles, the, the manuscripts, and all of the technical aspects that go along with those manuscripts. So yes. I'm, I'm ex as, as excited as I was to hear you present, I'm probably just as much excited to hear you comment on your presentation. So, so I do want to jump in with this, which, you know, there's this concept today, the young people, TLDR, too long, didn't read. <laughs> so here's the TLDR. So I discovered, I stumbled upon, um, identified really, the oldest, almost complete Torah scroll in the world uh, in St. Petersburg, Russia, in the Russian National Library. Now, they knew they had this Torah scroll. They just have, even now, they don't have any idea when it's from because uh, they're not Hebrew paleographers. Um, and, uh, and, I, and, and I originally called the lecture two newly identified 10th, 11th century <laughs> Oriental Torah scrolls because I discovered two of them there that are from the same period, but we didn't have time. I knew I wouldn't have time to talk about both of them. I do want to really quickly share, um, uh, there's this map from this book by Malachi Beit Aryeh. He is uh, really the top Hebrew codicologist in the world. Um, codicology is where you study how manuscripts are kind of constructed. Um, and so he has a map where he identifies the different regions. So here we have the five geocultural regions that are identified for Hebrew manuscripts. You have here uh, Ashkenaz. And this is, again, misleading because Ashkenaz in medieval times means Germany, right? So they'll distinguish between Ashkenaz and Salfat, which is France. But for the purpose of Hebrew manuscripts, this green area is Ashkenaz. Uh, the yellow area, or not yellow, sorry. Well, the yellow area is Orient or Oriental. It includes Iran today. Uh, we have Byzantium, we have Svarad. Svarad means Spain. But for the purposes of Hebrew manuscripts, there's no major difference between uh, a manuscript written in Kairouan, which was a major Jewish center of learning in Tunisia, and the ones written in uh, Lisbon or in, or in uh, you know, Toledo in Spain itself. And there are differences, right? Um, there's differences between... Uh, um, uh, Soria here in northern Spain in Toledo, right? Like I could see a, a, a codex of the Bible written in Soria and identify immediately what workshop that was made in because they're very distinctive, right? But in general, the, the, the shapes of the letters and everything um, are, this, this is the, the region, right? Sfarad. Um, so what we're dealing here is Orient, right? So uh, we say it's from Cairo because we know it's from the Cairo Geniza, but could have been written in Israel, right? We, we have no idea. I was going to pose a question. Why were you in St. Petersburg? Okay. Um, well, let, let's answer that question now. I was in St. Petersburg to study these manuscripts. Um, that's when I had the opportunity to examine the Leningrad Codex. And uh, I also wanted to look at the Torah scrolls because we have this problem in, in Jewish studies with or biblical studies where we have, um, or it's really Hebrew manuscript studies in general. So they went around the world for decades photographing all the Hebrew manuscripts they could get their hands on. This was the Institute of Hebrew, uh, uh, let's see, I, uh, IHM, the Institute of, he of Microfilm, IMHM, Institute of Microfilm Hebrew Manuscripts in Jerusalem. Uh, today it's part of the National Library of Israel. And when they came to Torah scrolls, they didn't photograph them because they said all Torah scrolls are the same. Why would we photograph them? And I, and not just me, over the last decades, people have started to realize, wait, that was a mistake. We should have photographed them. And so we're trying to get our hands on Torah scrolls to study, and not that many of them photograph. So you end up having to go to these places to look at them. And the ones in the National Library of Russia um, have been cataloged only in a very basic way, where it says, you know, this is number, you know, uh, uh, let's say three in, in this case, um, you know, parchment scroll number three. But what's in that scroll? Nobody knows. Nobody's looked at it. 
right? Somebody looked at it uh, like a, um, in the 19th century, uh, a guy named Avraham Harkavi. And since then, nobody who understands Torah scrolls at least has had an opportunity to look at it. I went there and I asked something very um, bold. I said, you have 250 Torah scrolls approximately. We'll give the actual number in, in the lecture. Um, uh, I want to see all of them. And they let me see nine while I was there. And of those nine, three turned out, or maybe even four turned out to be really important. So um, I'm speaking about another one of them at SBL, the Society of Biblical Literature, in November of this year. So, all right, let's play the video. I was in St. Petersburg, Russia in 2019 uh, with Viktor Golanets, who uh, I've seen around him here, but he's not here at the moment. And um, I asked to see the Torah scrolls they have. And just to give you an idea, uh, Victor Golanus recently had an article in which he uh, documented what there was. They've got a total of 275 Torah scrolls. Uh, there is a catalog of the, one of the collections of 36 of the scrolls, or 35 of the scrolls, EVR1A collection. But what about the other uh, 240 or so, or 30 scrolls? Um, who knows? So I asked to see them when I went to St. Petersburg. I was there for two weeks, and they let me see uh, nine of them. Uh, three of them were very interesting. Uh, I'm going to talk about one of them today. Um, I had just finished a class with, um, with Judith Schlanger. Uh, and in the class, she actually brought an example of a Torah scroll. And she said uh, of a fragment from the Oxford, where we were having the, the um, lectures. And she says, this is what the script of the year 1000 looks like. And then I go to Cambridge, and I spend a couple weeks there, and I see script that looks very similar. And I start to think, not only is it similar, I think this is the same scribe. And then I go to uh, Russia, and I find they bring out some of the scrolls, and I look at one of them, and I said, no, I know this is the, the same script, and maybe even the same scribe. And I wrote to Mordechai Weintraub, and he said, you're right, this is the same, the same Torah scroll, it's the same copy. So there were seven sheets of a Torah scroll, of which there's also pieces and sheets in Oxford and Cambridge, and how did it end up in, um, in uh, Russia? Clearly, Furkovich went to the Cairo Geniza, and he probably took the stuff that was on top or the good stuff that was easily accessible. Uh, I'm not going to talk about that scroll today. I'm going to talk about his brother, because the other scroll I am going to talk about is uh, it's called EVR2B. And I put the B in brackets, because in Golanitz's article, he doesn't call this collection B. But when I ordered photos, uh, of the scroll, I had to in indicate that it was B, so they think it's called B, I guess. Uh, parchment scroll three, and why parchment scroll? So this collection has um, 159 uh, leather scrolls and 33 uh, parchment scrolls, and you see there's a number missing, and that's because those are Esther scrolls. So these are Torah scrolls we're talking about today. So, um, so, th so this is an important point. What's the difference between parchment and leather? Um, you know, if, if you go on eBay right now and you buy a Torah scroll, uh, and you get one that's parchment, usually it's relatively young. And if you get one on leather, at least people think they're much older. Uh, and, it, and, and, and definitely the Dead Sea Scrolls are in some sort of a leather. Um, I say some sort of because it's not actually that straightforward. Um, the type of leather they use is different than the leather that was used in this period, which is the Middle Ages. But the interesting thing is the leather scrolls I looked at um, were actually younger than these parchment scrolls. Right, so, so this idea that leather has to be older than parchment is not necessarily the case. And what it seems happened, seems, what seems to have happened is sometime around the 14th, 15th century, there were people, especially in the um, Sephardic countries and what we call the Oriental countries, where they decided that uh, this is more archaic to have a leather scroll. And so they started making leather scrolls, even though earlier they had actually made parchment scrolls. And so you end up with this thing that's kind of upside down where the parchment scrolls sometimes are older than the leather scrolls. And, and that's definitely the case here, right? This is a Torah scroll from around the year 1000, and it's written on parchment. And Nehemiah, you had mentioned uh, uh, about a minute ago um, yeah. how this scroll possibly came here from a man named Furkovich. Right. Are you referring to Abraham so Abraham, Furkovich? Yeah, Abraham Furkovich was this Karite who was given... Um, a mandate by the Russian Tsar to go and investigate the history of the Jews and particularly of Karite Jews. And he traveled around the world looking for manuscripts and bought them. And eventually he sold them or his estate in some cases sold them after he died 
to uh, what became the Russian National Library in St. Petersburg. And the largest collection of, let's say, old Hebrew Bible manuscripts in the world today is in the Russian National Library in St. Petersburg. It's called the first Furkovich Collection and the second Furkovich Collection. Now, one of the things that Furkovich is notorious for having done was he's accused of having doctored the dates on some of these manuscripts. So Hebrew dating is, is, uh, or is really the rabbinical system of the creation of the world, but Karaites used it too. And for example, right now we're recording this in, in 2022, um, but in the, the Hebrew year is 5783. Okay, so now when you write those dates in Hebrew, the 5000 is written by a hey with a little chup chick, a little line over it or, or next to it. And it's really easy to change a hey 5000 into a dalid 4000. And Furkovich is accused of having done that. And what he did is he, if, if, he, if it's true that he did that, he then took, a let's say, a manuscript, uh, that was a codex, not a Torah scroll, because Torah scrolls don't have, don't have dates written on them. Uh, you're dating it based on the style of the writing. Um, so what he did apparently, or what he's accused of having done, is taken a year, you know, something from the 15th century and made it the 5th century, right? By just scratching off the left leg of the, of the hay. That's one thing he's accused of having done. The other thing he's accused of having done was um, really just manufacturing uh, colophons, that is, uh, little inscriptions in the manuscript that says, you know, this was written in such and such a year. And particularly one example is the Durbent scroll, which is a Torah scroll, which strangely has a colophon. And this, this is, I have to say, is one of the unusual things about these Torah scrolls in the St. Petersburg collection of Furkovich, is some of them have authentic colophons. And again, a colophon is when the scribe finishes writing, he says, you know, I finished this on such and such a date in such and such a year in such and such a place. So there's really important information. Normally, Torah scrolls don't have them. And the Torah scrolls that do have them, those colophons are fake. Except in the Furkovich collection isn't the only exception because there's other ones I've seen that are authentic. But probably the largest concentration of authentic colophons in Torah scrolls in the world is in the St. Petersburg collection. I asked to see those and wasn't, wasn't given, wasn't allowed to see those. I wasn't given those. I was given nine. Honestly, I was given, uh, I won't go into it. Uh, it, wa it wasn't exactly what I asked for, but I was happy to get what I could get. So this, this was collected by Furkovich, but he didn't get all of the pieces of the other scroll that we talked about because they were smaller fragments and some ended up in Oxford and some ended up in Cambridge. And now we can reunite those pieces into a single scroll. In this case, th that's not what happened. In the case of Parchment Scroll 3, it's intact, right? Meaning there's like little chunks that are missing, but other than that, the scroll is almost uh, entirely intact, right? 97.2% of the verses. I should point out that Nelson is the one who actually painstakingly counted the number of verses that were missing. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so based on that, there's 97, it's 97% complete. Well, I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it, so maybe it wasn't as painstaking as it, maybe it should have been. Okay, well, it's, it's so we have a, <laughs> a phrase in Hebrew uh, to say something is Sisyphic. Uh, it comes from the Greek uh, um, legend about Sisyphus, who was like pushing something up a hill, and every time he got to the top of the hill, it came back down. So Sisyphic work in Hebrew, though, means to do like something that's extremely detailed and almost never ending. So you did an, a wonderful Sisyphic job here, Nelson. And I just All want right. to say you, without maybe without knowing it, you teased our audience because a, a couple minutes ago you described how easy it is to change to change the date uh, yeah. from a hay uh, from a hay to a dalit, yeah. and uh, our audience will actually see an example of that very thing in oh. this manuscript later on. Okay, but there it wasn't to to corrupt the date; it was to fix no, the scribal no. error. No, no, no. Right. But they, but, okay. but what you, what you what you described changing right. a hay to a dalit will be able to exactly. see something like that. Very cool, all right. So it's 53 centimeters high, the text height is 40 centimeters. I actually wanted to verify those numbers by going back to St. Petersburg, but, um, and a bunch of details I wanted to verify, but events got ahead of me, so that was not possible. Um, this Torah scroll is nearly complete. Uh, it has, um, well, I mean, the, the Torah has approximately 5,853 5, verses, according to my Bible search program. And this uh, has completely preserved 97.2% of the Torah. Um, there's another uh, 
uh, 79 verses that are partially com uh, uh, missing, meaning maybe there's a letter missing, or maybe there's a half, a, half the verse missing, uh, and then completely missing is 83 verses. So, um, you know, there was a few years ago, there was the discovery of the Bologna Scroll, and it was a major discovery. It was a very important discovery, and there's a whole book about it, uh, because it's the oldest complete Torah scroll. Well, this isn't complete. It's 97.2% complete, but um, it's probably, well, according to what I learned from Judith Schlanger, it's maybe 200, 200 years or, or uh, older, um, meaning if it's from the 11th century, it could be 250 years older. So this one is, I mentioned now the second time, uh, Professor Judith Schlanger of the uh, EFE, the École Pratique des uh, Hautes Études, which I'm sure I'm mispronouncing, which is part of the uh, PSL University in Paris. It's one of the top universities in the world. And she is um, one of the top Hebrew paleographers in the world. So, uh, you know, she's kind of like the E.F. Hutton of Hebrew paleography, right? If she says this is from the year 1000, um, there's a very, very, very good chance it's from the year 1000. She would say, look, you know, it's, it's, you've got to, um, you know, take different lines of evidence as well, right? So, um, you know, but you can you can almost take that to the bank. Let's put it that way. That that's as close to a, a solid date as we could possibly have, without doing a carbon fourteen test. And even the carbon fourteen test is sometimes a bit iffy. So, um, you know, th this is in any event uh, the fact that she was able to date this script before she even saw the scroll. Right, she's basing it on on the fragments in Oxford. Um, that that lends a great deal of um, weight to the date of this scroll. Let's put it that way. Wow. Maybe more. So I think it's an important scroll. Has 57 sheets of 250 columns, three to seven columns per sheet, except the final sheet is two columns, which you know, you'd expect. Sheet 43 and 56 are one column replacement sheets in later hands. Uh, and I wanted to talk about those, but I'm not going to have time to today. Uh, sheet 55 that I'll just mention, we'll sh look at it real quick, is a two-column replacement sheet with 13-line patch in the third hand. Um, so the uh, original sheets are 49 to 52 lines per column, which is actually quite significant because one of the ways that I thought you could identify uh, pieces of the same scroll is counting the number of lines. But if there's a range of between 49 and uh, 52 lines, then it's not, you know, you, you could have two different pieces, fragments in the Geniza, with different number of lines, and, and they could be from the same scroll. Um, 43, 55, and 56 are replacement sheets between 51 and 52 lines per column. Um, this is what the, the uncomplete sections look like. Uh, you can see here is a sheet, and this might actually be a replacement sheet. I'm not entirely sure. I discussed it with Mordecai Weintraub, and, and he agrees that it might be, but we need to do some more. Uh, we probably need better photos, actually, as well. Uh, but from here all the way until the end of the Torah, with the exception of three sheets, is the complete Torah. Um, well, actually, there's actually another lacuna, um, or a couple more lacunae. But other than these, um, what do we have here? One, two, three, four chunks that are missing. And by the way, here it's a significant amount that's missing, right? We're missing all of the first column, and then almost the entire complete third, fourth, and fifth columns. Um, and maybe there is, there could be another column we're missing here, I don't remember. Um, so, but other than that, it's almost a complete scroll. Um, so look what happened here. Uh, it, it's, pr it's, it's, it's very light, because this is so well preserved, right? A lot of time when you're dealing with, with a piece missing like this, you look at it and you're like, okay, it was, it was consumed by um, mold or something like that. And you'll see traces of the mold all over the scroll. That's not the case here. This was eaten by a rodent. Almost certainly this was eaten by a rodent. I mean, he was chomping on that thing, and you can you kind of even see, like, where he was, you know, maybe it was a group of rodents, right? Um, and it's kind of sad, uh, but the rest of the scroll is complete, except for, like, little holes in other places, right? But here it looks like at the beginning of the scroll, the, um, the rodents, you know, went to work. And, I'm, and now that I'm thinking about it, I hadn't thought about this before, but go back to the previous image. Uh, so if you look at the third column there, the entire left half of the third column is missing. So how did they know to attach this to the fourth column? And it just occurred to me that these rodents might have been in St. Petersburg, not in the Cairo Geniza. 
And that's how they knew, because if this was pulled out of the Cairo Geniza, which was the synagogue in Cairo, where the stu stuff was stuck for a thousand years, um, I don't know that that, that top p that part piece on the far right would have even been attached. To it wouldn't have been attached, right? So how would they have known right. to connect it to the rest of it? So now I wonder if this happened in St. Petersburg sometime in the 1800s. And um, they're like, oh, okay, this piece is lying next to that piece. And so therefore they're, you know, and they're obviously a very similar handwriting and it's a continuation of the same scroll. I don't know that for sure. Um, the white uh, sheet that's been put in the background, that definitely was restored in St. Petersburg. Um, wow. I, I guess I don't know that for sure either. Maybe it was restored by Ferkovich or somebody who bought it from Ferkovich. I don't know. In any event, um, most of the scroll is much better preserved than this. So, and here I just want to jump in with a comment. So people are like, well, wait a minute, Nehemi, don't we have the Dead Sea Scrolls that have the, the Torah? Yeah, but we don't have a full copy of the Torah from the Dead Sea Scrolls. Our earliest complete copy of the entire Tanakh is the Leningrad Codex. What is our earliest complete copy of the Torah? I don't know the answer to that question. That's a good question. We should find that out. Um, it might be, and this isn't complete, right? It's missing little pieces. Um, but this might be the earliest complete, and, and here I'm talking about not just Torah scrolls, I'm talking about Torah scrolls and codexes. Codexes are in book form. Mm -hmm. um, so is there a codex that's earlier than this that has the complete Torah? I don't know the answer to that question. It's a good question. I don't think there is. I think this is the earliest complete Torah of almost complete Torah of anything, right? Not just of, of, um, of scrolls, but I could be wrong. I don't know. Now we have fragments from the Dead Sea Scrolls, right? Pieces, it might be a few sheets, right? Might be parts of a few sheets, right? There you definitely had mold and all kinds of problems. Um, you had bat dung that was falling on them from the, the caves and stuff like that. So they were damaged. Um, so it's a really good question. I don't know the answer here. Um, if this is the oldest Torah, yeah. So Nehemiah, a few minutes ago uh, during the presentation, you had mentioned that uh, it's 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 uh, there's a consensus that a scroll called the Bologna scroll is the oldest complete scroll uh, Torah scroll. Mm -hmm. um, and have you had a chance to look at that? So I've looked at photographs of it. I w was uh, in Ravenna, which is near Bologna, and I asked to see it, and they said no. But hopefully, in the coming months, I will be able to examine the Bologna scroll directly and carry out some scientific tests on it. Um, that is one of the objectives of the research that we're carrying out that the Institute of Hebrew Bible Manuscripts research. And uh, the, the part of the reason why the Bologna scroll comes to mind for me is also because yeah. it was it, it it had a very interesting um, phenomenon with the name of God, the Tetragrammaton that yeah. you spoke about in your district in your PhD dissertation. Right. So, so what happened there is, well, in general, it had an interesting phenomenon, which is that somebody forgot a word. And when you forget a word, there's actually, so, so here's an important point. The Torah scroll was used for rituals. And so it had to conform to a very specific set of rules. Whereas that wasn't necessarily the case in the codex. Sometimes they were used for rituals, but the people who used them for rituals weren't holding them to the same um, set of rules as the Torah scroll. Um, and so the, one of the rules is if you make a mistake, you write the mistake above the line. Unless the mistake is at the margin, then you can write it in the margin. But what if you make a mistake in the middle of the line and then are you allowed to put the word in the margin like we do today when we correct things? And the answer is 100% no, you're not allowed to do that. And in the Bologna scroll, he did it repeatedly. And he not only did it for regular words, he did it for the name of God, which that's a double no-no, right? That There's sources going back to the time of the Talmud that says you're not allowed to do that. Um, or even earlier than the Talmud, right? Tanaitic sources that say you're not allowed to do that. Um, yet the, the scribe of the Bologna scroll, who's in the 13th century, did it. And why did he do it? Because he wanted to, or that was his tradition to do that. Right, so we have a bunch of rules, but people didn't always follow the rules. So, which is one of the major themes of my PhD dissertation. So, <laughs> All right, let's watch some more. And uh, I'm going to share some, some of the characteristics of this scroll. Uh, like I said, uh, I wanted to do two scrolls, and I realized I don't have time to show everything for this scroll, so I'll do my best here. So we've got pricking marks with ruling lines that you can clearly see. Okay, so pricking marks are, uh, so one of, the, one of the rules for writing Torah scrolls is that it has to have uh, what's called sirtut, 
which is ruling lines. And ruling lines are, you know, we get, we get like a notebook today and it's got like those lines that are printed on it, right? Well, what did they do back then? So first of all, they didn't have pencils. Pencils didn't exist. Uh, certainly not around the year 1000, to the best of my knowledge. Um, certainly not in the Western world, right? Maybe they didn't, I don't know if they existed in China or not. But in this part of the world, they didn't exist. And so a Torah scroll is required even today to be written with ruling lines. And the ruling lines, they take a sharp instrument and they scratch the line along a ruler. They literally have like a straight edge and they scratch it to make a straight line. And then in, and then in some writings, they write um, with the base of the letter on the line, right? That's what we do in English. But that's not what they do in Hebrew. In Hebrew writing, the letters hang from the line. And you can actually kind of see that even in this photo that um, there's almost a straight line with the top of the, of the letters, and that lines up with the ruling line. Um, and what's the pricking mark? Well, how do you know how, where to hold the ruler? You need two, two lines to hold the ruler between, or two dots. And so they would make a hole in the parchment at regular intervals, and they would do it on the other side of the parchment. And then they would scratch uh, in size, sometimes with the back of the, of the um, they didn't use a quill, they used something called a, a kulmus, um, a reed. With the back of the reed or with some other sharp instrument, they would scratch in this ruling line, this vertical ruling lines. You can see the uh, vertical ruling lines there. The horizontal ones you can't see so well, you can kind of see them, I can see them, but you can definitely see the pricking marks. And we don't always see the pricking marks because the pricking marks are considered ugly. So they would usually do it way at the edge of either side of the sheet of a Torah scroll, and then they would cut that part out, or they would fold it over when they sewed the two, sh two sheets together, right? A Torah scroll is made of, of pages, or really sheets we call them, yiriot in Hebrew, uh, sheets that are sewn together. And a lot of times, usually, they were either trimmed off the, the, really, the pricking marks, or they were, um, or they were folded, folded over and, and hidden by the sewing, uh, by the seam. But in this case, you can actually see them, which is kind of cool. Thank you, Nehem. And I was actually going to ask uh, about a sheet. What is a sheet? So you yeah. you, you answered my question for yeah. you so, before. So even... sheet is a translation <laughs> of the Hebrew term, right? They're really pages, right? But in Hebrew, we call them sheets. Um, some libraries call them membranes. Um, I'm not a fan of that term, but, you know, it's just as good as any. Uh, Yiriot, sheets, is the Hebrew term. Um, and, and it's interesting. Let's think about it for a minute. Why uh, there's there's some interesting thing about the sheet. I mean, it, it's been argued that you know, well, the, you know, the tabernacle uses the same word uh, sheets um, for the tent around the tabernacle, or not the tent, the um, outer courtyard. And then those sheets were held up with hooks, and the word for that hook is vav, as in the letter vav, because vav actually means a hook, not a tent peg. It's actually a hook. And so some people have argued, uh, Dave, uh, Dr. David Moster has been on this program, has argued that, that when they would begin each column of the Torah scroll with a vav, it, he calls it a visual midrash. I don't know if I mentioned that in this lecture or not. Um, but it's the idea of, okay, if we have these yiriot, these sheets, let's take another piece of terminology from the tabernacle, which is the vav of the, of the columns. Oh, and then each column is called a column. Right? So, so it's a play on words there because the word column is something that holds up um, uh, uh, a, sh a sheet or a pillar, right? We say pillar in English, right? But in Hebrew, it's the same word, column, pillar, amud, but it's also a, um, a column of text, right? And so the sheet, the sheet is broken up into several columns. And then each column at the top is held up by a vav. And in this case, it's literally the letter vav. <laughs> so that's kind of cool. You have been listening to Hebrew Voices with Nehemia Gordon. Thank you for supporting Nehemia's Makor Hebrew Foundation. Learn more at nehemiaswall.com. <laughs>